Good morning, family of God. J.P. Greer here from the Sentinels for Christ on this August 28th, 2023, bringing you your Mark chapter 3, SFC 15 in the Word moment. I hope that you had a great weekend. I hope that you were the salt and the light. We were blessed in everything that we did and we touched in the name of Jesus. I'm going to encourage you this week um, as we put out one of our irregular, we don't do these a lot, um, messages that we call prophetic perspectives. And prophetic perspectives is uh, it, it's something that we speak into um, on occasion, probably uh, three to four times a year at the most, um, that we feel will help you as a Christian navigate the streams of, of what's going on in the world, maybe even in uh, around you in your community so that you're more effective in Christ. So check out that um, uh, message uh, called Prophetic Perspectives. There's a link to it right here um, on this uh, video message and you'll be able to go there. I also want to encourage you to stop by our YouTube site, which there is a link for you to sign up for YouTube. Now, I don't cry for people to sign up on anything or ask people to sign up on YouTube to get advertising and, and paid promotions. That's just the Lord takes care of all of our stuff. Um, sometimes we put an opportunity out for money for a particular fundraiser. It never goes to us. It goes right to a source and it's always overseas and it's almost always in an undeveloped country because the Lord has taken care of all of our needs in Jesus name. And God bless you, Stefan. I see you this morning from India. We love you, brother. We love your country. And um, so stop by and sign up for YouTube if you have it too. But I want to welcome today, okay, uh, Alfreda from uh, Mozambique. And I got to have to use my glasses here. Leonardo from India. Also Jamaica Leone from Sierra Leone. And ZB from Burkina Faso. Those are just four of the 206 people since Friday who decide to follow Sentinels for Christ. Now listen, everyone that chooses to follow Sentinels for Christ, um, they don't follow everything that we do. A, they just can't, okay? In some of the developing countries, I am well aware that watching a video, it takes up a lot of your download time and that costs money. Um, but what usually happens is, with every one of our messages, we're blessed to have some of our people um, attend uh, a live like Stefan today and some others will most likely join us. Um, but most of the people, they come back during the week and they catch the message. And over the course of a week, usually one of our messages is going to be watched um, between 500 to 1,000 times. And these are by people who, uh, they're just seeking the Lord, seeking good Bible study. They're leaders from other countries. We bless you guys. And I want to thank you for all the prayers and blessings that I get. You wouldn't believe the amount of people who just reach out and bless the Sentinels for Christ and bless me personally in the name of Jesus. Um, the, the Lord sees that, okay? That's a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name. And then the spiritual realm, it has power. Don't ever think a simple blessing doesn't have power, okay? When we bring something from our heart and our intent that aligns with heaven and where it's going, it's always good in the kingdom of God. So I bless you. But I want to talk just for a minute about prophecy because we've got the August 20, 23rd prophetic perspectives up right now. It's going to tell um, some things about what's going on in Africa, what to expect in, in uh, I believe, South America as well. And um, also some things about the, the United States, which is just going to help the church be who she's supposed to be in the United States. Um, I think the message is about 12 to 13 minutes long. The first half of that message will bless you, not because of what we are saying is going on in the world, okay? But because we take a significant amount of time to convey an understanding about prophecy, okay? We really do. There is so much misunderstanding about prophecy in the body of Christ, okay? So I think if you do watch a few minutes of that, at least the first half of it, um, I would encourage you to do it because you're going to be blessed, okay? Let me tell you something. I was an evangelical uh, for some, probably 75 to 80% of my Christian faith. And in 2015, the Lord really got a hold of me and he said something in my spirit, which really shook me, but I was ready to hear it because I was already frustrated and had been for several years. He said, you know nothing about the realm of the spirit. 
I didn't go to a charismatic Pentecostal service and have someone slay me in the spirit. I was seeking the Lord out of frustration and the Holy Spirit told me, you knew nothing me about the spirit. And then what I did was I, I, I asked the Lord, what do I need to do in response to that? And you know what? He didn't say go to a, uh, a Kenneth Hagin uh, convention, although Brother Hagin, whom I love, has gone home to be with the Lord. He didn't say go seek out John MacArthur's advice on it. <laughs> I love John MacArthur. He's as solid as a, I mean, that guy's a Bible teacher. He said, learn to pray. And when we learn to pray and what that meant, everything changed. And anyone who knows our ministry and who's partnering with us, like some of the people even watching today, um, they know the power of God when it comes to prayer. But anyways, God took me on a, a journey to understand some things that I was very confused about. So I want to be just a, a, a little bit transparent for a moment. People who have a misunderstanding of scripture and spiritual gifts, here, I'm going to give you something. Whether or not you're a pastor, whether or not you're the president of a Bible college in the United States, and you have a misunderstanding about the spiritual gifts. And here's how to identify if you have a misunderstanding about spiritual gifts. You believe in the teaching of cessationism. And what that teaches is that between the second and fourth century, the signs and wonders and apostolic gifts, the miracle gifts that they stopped. Here's the problem you have, okay? People take one verse out of 1 Corinthians 13 out of context to try and prove that point. And it's never a good idea to take one verse and build something, a huge theology, okay? The second reason is this, okay? That you have a misunderstanding, if that's you, because that was me, okay? Neither Paul, neither Peter, neither John, and none of the other writers in the New Testament, including Jesus Christ himself, said that the gifts would cease. So you got a problem in that you're at odds, okay, with the Word of God, although you claim to be interpreting the Word of God correctly. Brothers and sisters, any one of us, in Jesus' name, we can think we're something that, and we're not, or we can think that we have a passionate conviction about something, and it is not correct. You be careful what you teach. At Sentinels for Christ, we're blessed. We see amazing miracles take place in people's lives on a pretty regular basis. Not all the time, but I tell you what, if you believe you will see. Jesus was not able to perform miracles in his hometown. Why? Because they were intellectual people who we are told from scripture, and that's actually one of the passages we're going to read today, who didn't believe in him because they knew him. So they thought they had it all figured out, brothers and sisters. When we think we have it all figured out and we don't, we're in error. We need to repent. And all of us are going to come to that place in our lives, especially as teachers. And the best thing that we can do is to handle our teaching responsibly. And when the Holy Spirit tries to get our attention, say, hey, you need to rethink something. Repent, rethink it, and then bring life. Okay, not intellectualism in Jesus' name. The body of Christ doesn't need more intellectualism. It needs more power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Let's go forward with scripture today. We started in Mark uh, chapter 3 on Friday. Today, we're going to start with Mark chapter 3. Verse 13, Jesus appoints the 12 apostles. Are you ready? Here we go. Jesus went up the mountainside and called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. There were more than 12 here. You need to understand that, okay? <laughs> and he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that they might he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 that he appointed. Simon, who he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave them the nickname, the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went out to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. Pay attention to that. That's unique to Mark, okay? And the teachers of the law, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He's possessed by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. He's driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. 
How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Listen to what I'm saying. It's really important. People can be forgiven all of their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of an eternal sin. Hang on to that. That's going to be one of the focuses of our teaching today. And he said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Who is the, who is the they, okay? It's the Pharisees and the religious rulers. You need to receive that right now, okay? Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived and standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. And a crowd was stirring around him and sitting around him. And someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside calling you. And Jesus said, who's my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who were in the house within him, he said, here are my mother and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Those are some powerful words from our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about those today and you're going to be blessed. And listen, a lot of you are going to be blessed because we're going to talk about this unpardonable sin in a way where you're going to get some clarity of it, okay? By the time we get to this section in the Gospel of Mark, we're all the way close to the 13th chapter of Matthew, closing in on the 9th, 10th chapter of Luke. So again, the fastness by which Mark moves through his gospel and the choice of Mark under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not including many other things that are included in the Galilean ministry are very clear. But one thing that is very unique is that this incident is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels, meaning Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which go through Jesus' life pretty much chronologically. And it's this, that Jesus was able to cast out demons and the religious people, they had no defense against it. The religious people today have no defense against Christians who are able to cast out demons. And they criticize them today, just like they did back in Jesus' time. And that's why I talked to you the way that I did at the beginning of this message. Praise God, hallelujah, amen. Jesus is king, okay? Jesus is king. But they tried to set up Jesus and discredit his ministry all the time. And we find out that this incident is recorded where they finally, they say, listen, the only reason this guy can cast out demons is because he's actually part of Satan himself. He's beasible. And by labeling Jesus that name, they were saying that Jesus was a demonic god by the name of Beelzebul, the equivalent of Satan, the enemy of the faith of the Jews and our faith today as Christians. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, anything more offensive than saying Jesus is the devil? Hey, hello, uh, Wasim. God bless you, brother. Uh, it's just simply not. And the incident is actually between two bookends here, okay? By the time we get to this section in, uh, in Mark, the hostility between Jesus, if we read the other Gospels, has been in increasing, okay? In, in Matthew's Gospel, by this time, Jesus' disciples are called out and they're accused of not obeying the law for picking grain while they're walking through the fields. And the religious rulers say, hey, you're out of uh, of alignment. You're not one of us because you're picking grain on the Sabbath. So, so Jesus and his disciples were starting to receive a lot of criticism over that. Religious people will always criticize a movement of the gospel. I'm going to say that again, okay? Religious people will always criticize a movement of the gospel. Now, brothers and sisters, if you are moving and flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit and you're criticized by religious people, you are not to consider them enemies. You're to bless them in Jesus' name, okay? Maybe they don't have insight or the depth of a relationship with the Holy Spirit at that point in their life and you are not to curse them, all right? But Jesus was getting set up regularly by people. We remember, as we read in the previous chapter, that they sat a man down in front of him who had a shriveled up hand during the church service to test him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath because 
wow, if God did something glorious and healed people on the Sabbath, how in the world could this rabbi named Jesus be a representative from God? Boy, that reflects some blind thinking, right? But you'll remember that a Pharisee invited Jesus to a dinner at his house in Luke chapter 14 about this time as well. And there was a man who had some type of swelling there and his kidneys could have been going bad. His heart could have been going bad. That caused a swelling. Who knows? Jesus cures him in the middle of the dinner. And because it's the Sabbath, they criticize him again. Okay. The authority of Jesus, which we've been talking about for a couple chapters, is demonstrated here. And I want to bless those of you who are listening today in a way that it's going to help you. You are not to follow people who do not have a relationship with Jesus. And there are many people who are teaching in churches today who represent that they are something that they are not. If your spirit is not rebellious and feels like there is something wrong with the leadership over you, start praying for God's clarity over it. And if you do not get okay, clarity over it, and you sit in a position of uncomfortableness to where you cannot get anything from that ministry, leave, okay? It's probably not anointed. I want to talk to you about that in a way. Jesus goes on to talk. That's going to blow some of your minds, especially some of you who are pastors, um, but I bless you. I'm not cursing any of you guys, okay? I told you at the beginning of, of this, I spent 75 to 80 percent of my Christian faith without any relationship really with the Holy Spirit. You know what that means? Let me be really transparent with you. Hmm, I wonder if I was really saved. Because the Bible says that the Holy Spirit dwelling within us confirms that we're God's children. And I can tell you today, I know I'm one of God's children because the Holy Spirit is living within me in Jesus' name. And I hope he is too, and I hope you have that confirmation. Jesus goes on to say the following, okay? He points to the ridiculous logic of what they're saying, that he's the devil casting out the devil. That's pretty easy for us to understand. Then he goes on to say uh, another depth of that, and he says, and any house divided against itself can't stand. That's a message for you and me. Because if we have a divided house of God or a divided assembly, okay, like the Corinthian church, it's going to be shaken and its effectiveness will be limited. But Jesus goes on to say something about his authority in a symbolic allegorical form or what we would call as a spiritual representation of a spiritual truth. He goes to say, hey, only a strong man can go into a strong, a strong man's house, beat him up, tie him up, and take everything that he has and conquer the stronger man. And Jesus is referring to himself saying that he is the stronger man when it comes to Satan. And there is an authority issue being declared to these religious rulers that we are told the reason why Jesus makes that statement. He tells them, I'm the stronger one, okay? I can go in, I have all authority to control everything underneath me because he's already testified by this point that he's the son of God. And the scripture tells us in this section that he makes this statement because they were saying he had a demon. Then Jesus goes on to say a statement that confuses so many Christians that we want to end our study on today. He says, anyone who says any type of slander against the son of man himself, he's referring to. Mark didn't use the term son of man himself. Matthew does. Luke does. He says, anyone who, who makes this type of slander against me, you'll be forgiven. But he who slanders against the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven. I want to explain to you what that is, okay? In the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, okay, Jesus says something that is so important through the scripture that we simply must pay attention to it. He says, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Equating the fact that the triune part of our God, who is three in one, and that goes beyond our mind to understand it, are all intertwined to the point where they are distinctly unique, but they're not separate. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not separate from one another. Whatever happens, it happens in conjunction with each other. So when Jesus says that he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, he's talking about someone who's rejected himself, okay? Because you can't reject the Holy Spirit and Jesus separately and be saved, okay? They're one and the same. The Bible teaches when we become Christians, God's Spirit resides in us. 
So if you have a problem with the Holy Spirit, you have a definite reason to uh, test yourself and see if you're in the faith. So beloved, some of you, and I get this because I've been a Christian counselor for over two decades, they're, they're afraid in a, in a moment of anger and frustration in life, um, and, and we all have them. Some people curse God, okay? And they get so angry, they curse Jesus and they curse the Holy Spirit, okay? And they think they have blasphemed and they have done the unpardonable sin. That is not the unpardonable sin. A permanent rejection of Jesus Christ who is overlapped with the presence of the Holy Spirit and that revelation in our life is the unpardonable sin. When we say something outrageous to God because life has given us something that we couldn't handle, and then we realize in our conscience that, oh, wow, God, I shouldn't have done that, and we repent, that just shows us that the Holy Spirit is residing around us, within us, and convicting us to get our attitude correctly, okay? Don't let the enemy of our faith, the devil, okay, tell you that you've committed the unpardonable sin if you still have a conscience and realize that you need Jesus and his blood covering and his presence in your life to make you whole and complete. That's the evidence that you're, that you're okay, okay? That the Holy Spirit is residing amongst you. Hallelujah, that's right, brother. I, I see that agreement on that, all right? So the unpardonable sin is simply not speaking out something that's blasphemous against God. Good grief. <laughs> If we all went to hell for speaking blasphemy, blasphemy against God, we never would have gotten saved. Because think of what came out of our mouth prior to becoming saved, right? However, there's even a lot of us who after we get saved and we open up the door to the devil or the devil comes into our life and he serves something up, man, and it's awful. And we blame God for it. We curse God for it, okay? The Bible tells us in 1 John, right? We have an advocate with Jesus and that when we sin, that he's there to purify us through us coming clean with him. If you confess our sins, our state of rebellion, he's just and faithful to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Let me tell you another thing, how good God's grace is. This is going to rock some of you. You know, we don't always walk in perfect acknowledgement of what we're <laughs> of what we're sinful about, friends, okay? We have items in our life that we don't even know they're sinful yet. Do you know Jesus covers us too? Do you know why? Because he's full of grace and he's looking for those who are worshiping him in spirit and truth. That truth statement doesn't mean that we have all truth, okay? It means we are worshiping him in spirit and truth and open to the truth being revealed to us through the Spirit of God, in God's timing, which is perfect. And sometimes against our human will, our human will, which is just not working with God to get the truth. But if we are in Christ, God forgives us, and our advocate Jesus is even covering us for that, okay? So it's so important that we think of our relationship with Jesus as that. A relationship, okay? Not a bunch of stated words. Jesus' family, they thought he was crazy. And we find this out in Mark, that they were trying to help their brother Jesus by saying, leave him alone, he's just crazy, because by now he had offended the Pharisees so many times that were told in the Gospels that there's a death sentence for him, okay? But Jesus is going to keep on doing what he is going to do, and he says to those around him, right? that the people who are my family are those who hear my words and do it. That's what makes us a member of the family of God. So I bless you this week. When we come back again, we will be going into the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark and moving on from there. Please pray for Burundi this week. We have our seventh swim spiritual war intercession ministry prayer school taking place and there are some 35 young adults and older adults as well who are learning how to pray how to hear the holy spirit in jesus name so that they can go back to their churches and experience the presence of god so that then they can go back to their communities and see god change the community in jesus name jp greer here from the sentinels for christ saying until we meet again 
in Jesus' name.